Performing caregiver tasks such as taking vital signs or giving a bed bath may seem rather simple compared to the development of therapeutic skills. Hi, I'm Kathy Getrist, and today we're going to be talking about therapeutic interactions. Therapeutic interactions means the helping relationship that you develop with your coworkers and the patients with whom you work. In a busy facility, it's often easy to forget that the individual in that bed has some very unique needs and is a unique individual. We cannot assume that everyone is like we are. Our ways of relating to others and behaving are determined by many factors. Some of those factors are the age of the person. Somebody at 20 might relate very differently than somebody at the age of 80. Religion also is a factor that uh, varies depending on uh, our belief system. If a person has a belief that God is in control of their life and, and that God has uh, their best interest at heart, they may behave or relate to you in a different way than someone who might be an atheist who does not believe in God and finds most or all of their meaning in the quality of life right here on earth. Another factor is income level. If a person comes to you that does not have health insurance or is poor economically, it's going to be much more difficult for them and their behavior may be different than someone who isn't worrying about those factors. Gender makes a difference in how we relate to others and how we behave as well. Men typically have more difficulty showing their emotions than women. Communication that men have is different than women, so the way they relate to others changes based on the gender. Culture is another factor. I'd like you to think back when you were growing up to what were some of your health care practices in the culture in which you came from. A couple of things that come to my mind is that my mother felt that chicken soup could solve just about anything. And that was the first line of defense when we became ill. My father uh, believed that working hard was very important. He was a farmer. And if he got a fever, he thought working it off was really the way to resolve that problem. And he felt that going to a hospital or to a doctor was a sign of weakness. And the better thing to do was to tough it out. I'd like you to watch several people from different cultures describe their health practices from their experience. My parents were born in China. Both of them immigrated to the United States um, as adults. And I was born in Milwaukee, so I was raised in this culture. I am a second generation Mexican American. I was born and raised in Texas. My, my mother and father were both born and raised in Texas. I grew up in an urban community, and as a child, my father used to take oranges, make fresh orange juice, and put castor oil in it and he felt that was a cure for the common cold. Um, when I was growing up, I remember that whenever I had a stomach ache, my mother took out a little thin vial with little brown pellets in it, and she told me to take eight of them, and it always worked. But I also remember a particular remedy that my mom used to, you know, use on us, and that was the use of, of uh, tomatoes uh, that were mixed with some uh, herbs that were then applied to uh, the council area around our neck. Um, my parents were raised in India, but we moved to America when I was a baby. Um, when my sister and I got measles, my mother made a salve. I remember uh, part of it was sulfur and some other ingredients that had an awful odor. She would spread it over our bodies, and then she would take socks and put a basting stitch around the neck of the sock, 
and put it on each of our hands so that we couldn't scratch our bodies. We believe in all the prophets, but the last prophet, we believe in Muhammad. He said the um, onion seed is the cure for every disease except for death. So we take a little, uh, just a pinch of onion seed in the morning with our breakfast. And I guess I still have my tonsils. That remedy worked. It would, the remedy would go away. I mean, the pain in the, or the ailment would go away. Uh, so, do I believe in, in those things? Yes, I do. Sometimes when I have an upset stomach, I think I wish I had those little brown pellets to take. I'm sure many of those health practices were unfamiliar to you. Just a reminder that we are not all alike and we need to remember that each is an individual with unique uh, needs and behaviors. We develop relationships with everyone we know. Some of those relationships are lasting and very rich, deep relationships, and others are more casual. Most of the satisfaction that a caregiver gets from their work comes from the quality of the interactions that they have with patients and staff. Some people call this the ability to get along with others. Good relationships with others begin within each one of us. It's not necessary for you to personally like somebody in order to be pleasant and cooperative with them as you carry out your duties. Perhaps the single most important characteristic that you bring to your job is your attitude. Some people talk about someone having an attitude, and the way they're using that is thinking about attitude as negative or opinionated, but all of us have an attitude, and this attitude can either be positive or it can be negative. All of the other characteristics are an outer reflection of our inner feelings, our attitude toward yourself and towards others. Your attitude should reflect warmth. That means showing a friendly, interested, and caring attitude without overwhelming the patients with a false sense of cheerfulness. Warmth means showing respect genuine interest and in caring about them. Trust is another thing that needs to be shown. That must be present for help to be given and received. A therapeutic relationship is firmly rooted in trust. For trust to be developed, it must be consistent. Being consistently trustworthy is an expression of your personal integrity and builds the foundation for an effective relationship. There will be times that you're, you will have an opportunity to develop trust or lack of trust with your patients. If a person asks you to, uh, to get them some water and you say, all right, Mrs. Jones, I'll do that and I'll be right back. And if you come right back with that water, that helps demonstrate trust because you've followed through on your commitment. If a caregiver asks you to come by a patient room at 10 o'clock because they need some assistance in turning that individual and you follow through and come by at the time designated, that demonst demonstrates uh, trust as well. Empathy is understanding another person's perception of a situation. The phrase, walk a mile in my shoes, describes empathy really very well. Through empathy, we are able to see the world from the patient's perspective with as much understanding as possible. Empathy is not the same thing as sympathy. Sympathy is a feeling of pity for a patient's situation and can actually paralyze your ability to provide the best care possible. If you feel that your sad feelings for a patient's situation is getting in the way of your providing them with the best care possible, please talk to your supervisor about that. From my experience, at one point I worked in a hospital, 
a patient came in who was just about my age in her late 30s and she had two daughters that were approximately the same age as my daughters. She had been having a lot of abdominal pain but had not come into the hospital or sought any medical advice because she did not have insurance but instead a neighbor was willing to give her some of her pain pills that she hadn't used until the pain got so excruciating she had no choice but to seek medical attention by the time she got to the hospital uh, surgery was performed and she had a cancer that had spread everywhere and they were only giving her a few weeks to live I was so sad about that situation because I was putting myself into her position having daughters the same age worrying about their future and I needed to talk to the head nurse of the unit and ask that I not be assigned to take care of that patient any longer because the care that I would provide for her was not the best quality of care that she deserved. Accepting the patient is a person worthy of, as a person worthy of dignity is basic in providing care. Acceptance means working with patients, even those who may display some undesirable behaviors, and you need to do that without rejecting them. Acceptance also means caring for individuals whose value system may differ greatly from your own. Think of some behaviors that you find objectionable. It might be someone who's a smoker, it might be someone who's extremely obese, maybe homosexuality is difficult for you, someone who has had an abortion, uh, excessive use of alcohol, those uh, things might be uh, areas that you struggle with. Even when patients engage in behavior that you think is wrong, bad or immoral, they still have a legal and ethical right to have high quality care provided. Sometimes gaining some knowledge about a person with a behavior that might have been objectionable to you can help change your perception. I worked with a fellow and over the uh, course of time that I worked with him uh, we became better and better friends. He was extremely good at what he did. He was very caring to the uh, students that he worked with and he had a wonderful sense of humor and commitment to his job and as we became closer he uh, shared with me that he was a homosexual. Well I had had very limited knowledge about homosexuals in my past but the little I thought I knew I didn't know that I liked. Getting to know this individual helped me a great deal because he was able to uh, help dispel some myths and some misconceptions that I'd had about homosexuality and as a result changed my perception about him as an individual and about homosexuality in its entirety. There will be times when you experience anger, frustration, or hurt because of a patient's behavior or the comments that they may make. Coping with your feelings in an acceptable way is really essential. Some acceptable ways for you to cope with them might be to just leave the room. Of course, before you do that, you want to make sure that the patient was in a safe situation, that they had a call light with them. But sometimes just leaving the room, having a chance to cool down a little bit, and going back in later, or having someone go back in your place can help in, a, in helping you cope. Another way would be to discuss these feelings that you're having with your supervisor. Many times the supervisor has uh, had this experience in the past and may have some helpful tips for you. Engage in physical activities. Our jobs are stressful. Many times physical activity can help diffuse some of that stress. Unacceptable ways of coping include yelling at the patient or another caregiver, threatening them, demeaning them, or slamming doors. Those or any other um, negative ways uh, are unacceptable. 
Determining the reason that a person behaves in a certain way can help us know how uh, better to help. One time, a patient was putting their light on incessantly. And you will find that there may be patients like that, that you'll just get done providing them with something, you'll leave the room, and the light's back on again. Well, after that happens numerous times, that gets rather annoying. And so I thought, you know, I better sit down and talk to this person and find out what's going on. In the course of the conversation, I found out that this individual was really frightened that she was going to die. And she was very afraid that she was going to be alone when that happened. And for her, she thought the best way that she could assure that she wasn't going to be alone is to put the call light on repeatedly and make sure that someone was there in her room most of the time. Well, knowing that, I was able to come up with some strategies for her to have a sense of, um, of, uh, of not being alone at the same time not continuing the practice that was irritating to not only myself but other caregivers. We all have a personal space, a private zone, sometimes people call it a bubble that's around us, that we believe is an extension of ourselves and belongs to us. We carry this space with us at all times wherever we go except for a very select number of other persons whom we allow to enter that space, could be your children or a spouse, we tend to be uh, uncomfortable if others enter that space. Remember how it feels if you get on an elevator with a bunch of strangers and uh, you need to be closer to these strangers than you really feel comfortable with? That's, that's uh, an example of how our personal space might be uh, violated. The size of this space appears to be partially determined by culture and can vary considerably. In some cultures, in Mideastern culture and uh, Russian cultures, it's not unusual to, uh, greeting of strangers, particularly for men, to be kissed on either cheek. That's something that our Western culture doesn't, uh, doesn't embrace. Although individuals vary in their need for space, in our Western culture, most persons maintain similar distances from each other according to their relationship and the activities that are being uh, undertaken. For example, two men that are strangers on opposing teams might grapple with each other on a football team, on a football field, when they would never think of doing that at the end of the game in a locker room. The accepted level of personal space in our culture depends on the situation. It ranges uh, from a very intimate space of less than a foot to a personal space that would be a close friend to a social space which would be um, ca uh, casual acquaintances and then the farthest distance would be a public space, uh, which is usually greater than about 12 feet. In our culture, if one person feels that a second person is coming too close, the first person tends to back away to maintain that desired distance between the two. In fact, backing away shouldn't really be necessary and any subtle movement of the body in a backward motion sh should signal to you to stop that you're getting too close to their personal space or their bubble that is around them. Consider this when you approach a patient in a bed or a wheelchair. Remember that their confinement prevents them from backing away from you. Be aware of subtle movements such as uh, moving the, the head, uh, tucking the chin, tensing muscles, or avoiding eye contact that indicate discomfort with the space that's between the two of you. The issue of touch requires much sensitivity. Because healthcare is a hands-on profession, it's our daily practice to touch people often and intimately. However, we must constantly be aware that touch has many meanings 
for our patients. It may indicate such things as agreement, caring, love, and, easily, and even sexual desire. Many patients are hungry for a hand grasp or other form of touch and will demonstrate this by reaching out. If ever you've been in a gathering of senior citizens and someone brings a pet in, uh, a dog or a, a small child, you'll notice that many of the uh, senior citizens will reach out and try to um, have some contact with either the pet or the small child. Have tremendous needs for touch that may not be met at that time in their lives. Most desire or feel neutral about such touching as a pat on the shoulder during the course of non-normal uh, conversation. However, patients who have been physically or sexually abused tend to see uninvited touch of any kind as a boundary violation. People also of the Islamic faith uh, find touch by someone of the opposite gender very offensive. If a client has not indicated a specific desire to touch or be touched, you should determine their feelings about touch before using it. A uh, rule of thumb usually is always ask before touching. It's easy to ask, may I touch your arm? Or in another situation, you might say, um, I would like to give you a hug. Would that be okay? Touch has different meanings and therefore may soothe or could irritate and cause someone to bristle. It must be used carefully based on the patient's needs and wishes. The use of humor as a therapeutic intervention is not a new idea. Florence Nightingale, considered the mother of nursing, recognized the uh, connection between mind and body long, long ago. She recognized the importance of humor as a skill for a caregiver and used it herself. Humor can assist in establishing a relationship because it helps break the ice, decrease fear, and establish trust. Humor is a means of sharing. Thus, it can be used to strengthen relationships. It's imperative that the caregiver be sensitive to the patient's interpretation of humor. Humor is defined to a great extent by one's cultural background. To determine appropriate humor for an individual, it's important that you make note of the type of humor that the patient uses and the things that make the patient laugh or smile. For example, if you used sarcasm, uh, uh, for example, saying, you know, if you don't get off your butt, you're going to be glued to it, that might be motivating for some person to exercise, but for somebody else, it might be a real insult. So be sensitive to the type of humor that the individual embraces. Humor helps individuals to relieve stress, to express anger, and is a powerful tool for coping. Caregiver, caregivers turn to humor often as we uh, have to uh, carry on life and death situations every single day at work. Although humor can relieve tension and stabilize high-stress situations, it must be used with caution. It can be dangerous and destructive if used carelessly. Health care providers should always presume that a patient and a family can hear their comments. One time I worked in a hospital and we had a patient that was close to the nurse's station and close to our break room who was dying. As her health declined, her husband spent more and more time at her bedside to the point where he was spending almost 24 hours a day there. And as a result, as he saw his wife declining, he um, was becoming more and more sad about the situation naturally. 
He'd gotten to know the caregivers very well, knew most all of us by name, all three shifts. And after she died, he came to me and he said very despondently, he said, I just can't understand it. He said, they seem to care so much about my wife, but he said, the minute they'd leave the room, they'd head into the break room, have something to eat, laugh with their friends as though nothing was on uh, bothering them. He was at a place where he couldn't understand how caregivers needed to use humor to diffuse some of the stresses of, of a caregiver's day. But knowing that it would have been important that the break room uh, be a place where uh, caregivers could have that kind of humor, but not within earshot of patients and their families. Throughout every situation, listening must occur. Listening involves paying attention. It's something that you have to do actively. It takes work to actively listen to someone. A good listener encourages the speaker to continue. Responses such as, go on, or, oh yes, those kinds of remarks indicate that not only is the individual listening, but they're thinking about what's being said. Sometimes a gesture like a nod or a smile can also convey that message. Have you heard the phrase, in one ear and out the other? Well, that's a phrase that talks about not listening to an individual. We all have experience talking to someone who we know is not listening to us very carefully. They may have their uh, eyes downcast in a magazine, or they may have one ear listening to TV or watching television while we're talking. And the message that's being conveyed is that what we're saying really is not that important to them. There are some problems that interfere with listening. Some people listen selectively. That is, they hear only what they want to hear, or they hear what they think the message is going to be. Listening can be a healing process. We all have a need to express our ideas and the need to be heard, and so it's very important that you actively listen to your patients. Sometimes you'll have patients that don't want to talk, Sometimes they aren't uh, able to talk, or sometimes it might be a situation that they don't have the energy to talk. That does not mean that they don't want to have uh, someone close to them. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is to offer ourselves. Sometimes the best interaction is silence. You can say something like, it's okay if you don't want to talk right now, but if you'd like, I could stay with you for about 10 minutes. Offering yourself may be exactly what an individual needs in that situation. Therapeutic interactions between caregivers and patients can bring a great deal of satisfaction for both of, not only the caregiver, but also for the resident. The most effective tool that we have for developing meaningful relationships is not some sophisticated piece of equipment, some machine that has lots of whistles and bells, but rather it's ourselves.